Hey gang, David Michael Phelps here. Today on Working Man, we've got a guest with a very unique resume. He's a priest, moral theologian, and the rector of St. John Fisher Seminary in Stanford, Connecticut. Before being ordained in 1997, he worked in air freight, and prior to that, he spent several years in the Marine Corps as a tank commander. That's right, a tank commander who is now a priest. His name is Father Paul Check, and he knows a thing or two about a thing or two when it comes to fatherhood, manhood, and forming young men in holiness. On today's episode, we talk about the correct understanding of virtue, discipline, authority, and freedom, why men need a correct understanding of these things in order to flourish, and who is, aside from our Lord and Our Lady, Father Check's favorite character in the Bible. I'll give you a hint. It begins with a C, and it rhymes with Enchurian. So without further ado, here's my chat with Father Paul Check. Well, my name is Father Paul Check. Uh, I'm a priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, or... Uh, 23 years. I'm 60 years old, and so I came to the priesthood uh, uh, a little bit late. I entered the seminary when I was 32. Uh, I had attended Rice University uh, in Houston, Texas on a NROTC scholarship, and in the beginning of my junior year, I declared myself a Marine option, and so I uh, was commissioned a second lieutenant. Uh, in the Marines on uh, the day I graduated from Rice with a bachelor's degree in history and political science. And I spent nine years on active duty uh, uh, in the Marine Corps. I was a tank officer by by uh, specialty. I commanded two tank companies and I spent uh, time overseas, both in Europe and um, in, uh, in the Pacific. And all of that time was uh, uh, splendidly formative uh, for the kind of work that I'm I'm doing now, I remember uh, an occasion when I was a young lieutenant. I think I was in the uh, presence of a more senior officer, perhaps a colonel, was talking to a couple of us, and he said, "Remember that your Marines are your sons, so treat them that way." And that that stuck with me, left a deep impression, and that's the way I approached my work as a platoon commander and a company commander. I resigned my commission uh, as a captain in 1990 uh, before the Gulf War broke out. And I worked for a couple of years in the air freight industry, which was uh, also formative. I spent the second half of that period of time working second shift. So going in at three in the afternoon and you know finishing up at midnight. So I, I learned how a lot of uh, people work and live uh, somewhat out of sync with the rest of the world, and it gave me an, a, uh, an appreciation for that. And then uh, during that time, I was a lector in my local parish. Uh, the, the priest who was the pastor took an interest in me. He proposed uh, for my reflection the possibility of entering the seminary. That's what I did. And uh, I studied a year here in my diocese and then was in Rome for five years, ordained in 97. And my specialty is uh, moral theology. I have a licentiate in moral theology, and so I've taught that now for uh, 20 years. And my current assignment is as the rector of our college seminary and pre-theology program called St. John Fisher. So here's how I'll frame that. Uh, tank commander, and then working fella, and then priest. What did you learn in the first two that helped you with the third? Well, uh, so in, in, in the Marine Corps, uh, my, my men were uh, uh, enlisted Marines, uh, as well as when I was a captain, uh, young lieutenants. The first time I was a company commander, I was a 24-year-old first lieutenant, and my first sergeant uh, had been in the Marine Corps longer than I had been alive. So there was a, a, a strong introduction to uh, the, the, the world of uh, forming men in a professional and uh, uh, moral uh, way. And of course, in the case of the Marines in combat, for combat. In the uh, two years in the air freight industry, I was a line manager, supervisor, and the, our workforce was supplied by the Teamsters. And uh, so, you know, these were uh, good men, rugged guys who were uh, working hard uh, to support their families in a demanding industry. And they uh, 
uh, knew about my military background and, and uh, over time you know, we seem to get on well. So I, I think to, to answer your question, David, uh, respect is something that men desire and want to earn and also want to bestow on other men that uh, deserve it. And so that means that the, the world of men uh, it, at its best is shaped by virtue because virtue is what we respect in other people. We may envy someone else's position in terms of their money or their influence or their power or I mean, their natural charm or beauty or something. But properly speaking, what we admire is virtue. And in Latin, uh, the word for virtue is virtus. And the root of that word vir is the Latin word for the masculine of the species. So there's a connection there that to, to be a man is to strive uh, for virtue. So whether it's, a, in, you know, my, my background is was in the military and in this short time in, in, a, in another world, this, this aspect of men respecting each other and, and respecting virtue uh, was something that left a, an impression. And that came with me into uh, the priesthood. I mean, my professional interest is, as I said, teaching moral theology, which is about the life of virtue and holiness patterned on the life and virtue, the holiness of the God-man. And uh, in my particular work now, it is helping men to realize their potential by growing into the virtue that uh, not just earns the respect of other men, but more importantly, helps them to be uh, the man they are to be in God's eyes. What have you experienced as the largest barriers for men being formed in virtue? What what gets in their way the most? Well, typically they're going to be things that are uh, obstacles that e- were either were handed to them through no fault of their own, or they will be obstacles that they themselves have put in their own way. So in the former category today, we would see what are commonly referred to as family of origin questions or problems or issues, things that uh, follow from broken families, from uh, poor examples of, of fatherhood or, or complete lack of fatherhood and, and other difficulties that have been part of the, the, the cultural demographic in which a, a young man uh, grows up, which cuts across all kinds of socio and economic lines. In the second category are, are going to be difficulties that a man uh, himself places in his own way. Some of them are going to grow out of technology uh, and, uh, and, and, and over involvement in that. You know, I read somewhere years ago that the average age of a video gamer in the United States is a 33-year-old man. So that is of some concern because that's not allowing him to grow in virtue. And it's a uh, uh, kind of terrible waste of time. Um, and then there are going to be problems that grow out of the sexual revolution. So there'll be sexual promiscuity and, uh, and, and oftentimes uh, problems with uh, pornography. So those are going to be uh, real challenges that we, we face. And, uh, they're, they afflict men again across the board, in, 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 including fellows who uh, believe they may have a vocation to priesthood and, and enter the seminary. So, if that's if that's if those are the types of baseline in the obstacles that young men face, what what do you where do you usually begin? What's what are the first steps up that staircase of virtue? Sure. So now we're back to the question of respect. I think because there has to be some platform upon which the teaching can be conveyed and received. And that platform is going to be the relationship that will be established that uh, in my work will be a, a, a complementary image of a father-son relationship. So in this case, priest and a seminary and spiritual father and spiritual son. And that, uh, for that platform to be built and for that relationship to grow, for there to be mutual respect, uh, there has to be trust. And that is something uh, that uh, grows over time. A man who is coming into the seminary in the same way that a young man is entering the military is likely inclined, uh, maybe in a more than average way, to trust the 
the, the, those who will be responsible for his formation. Um, but it needs to be something that's more than, than, than formal or, or, or superficial. It has to be deep. And that trust, that bond takes time to forge. And it depends uh, on the integrity of, of both parties, especially the integrity on the part of the, the formator. It depends on his witness to what it is that he claims to hold and, and, and to convey and to teach. You know, so I like to say by way of analogy that uh, if you want a good Cabernet, you need more than crushed red grapes and water. There are a lot of other forces that have to come uh, to bear, and you need time for for that that wine to be produced. Now, of course, Cana is, is a great exception mm-hmm. to that. Uh, but uh, in, in the main, trust is something that has to grow up. Uh, not only because virtue is seen and recognized, but because a relationship is built on mutual trust. Yeah. Do you find um, in in the time that you've obviously you've been a priest for you know, twenty three years now, have you found that uh, changing at all as far as uh, how willing young men are to trust? Well, I, I think there's that there, there, we have a lot of different crises that um, are before our nation, and one of them is a crisis of authority. So, I mean, we have a crisis of faith, surely, and there's a, a kind of a, a metaphysical uh, crisis and an epistemological crisis, and there's ethical uh, crisis as well. All these things are very real. Uh, but authority is something that is challenged, whether it's in the family, in the civil order, or in the church, and there's a general suspicion of it. And because we have so many counterexamples to good authority, there is understandably going to be a suspicion. Uh, you have to prove yourself to me. Uh, that's regrettable, but it's understandable. And that means it's more incumbent on those who hold authority to uh, be integrated personalities, uh, men of virtue in the case of, you know, we're talking about forming men. Um, and also to remember that the word authority comes from a Latin word that means to build up, to give increase, to make something more than it was. In other words, it's to serve. Uh, as opposed to something tyrannical or self-serving. You once told me about your favorite character in the Gospels, aside from our Lord. Centurion. Yeah. yeah. Why is that? I mean, it seems related to this to this question, right? I, yes, sure it is. Um, I, I'd like to do a series of talks or maybe a retreat one day called uh, The Heroes of Jesus. And these would be people in the Gospel that he not only admires, but he holds up for us to imitate, starting, of course, with his blessed mother. Uh, uh, But the centurion is one of them. Uh, He's not a member of the covenant, so he's not uh, of the chosen people, Gentile. And uh, the sacred writer records for us that our Lord is, is, is amazed by this man. He praises him for his understanding of authority. Uh, and he says, I, uh, I, am a, I am a man under authority, and I have men under my authority. So it's the submission of the centurion to the hierarchical structure in the military that he's part of that helps him to understand that uh, authority is, is, is something natural and good. Uh, it, it is directed towards building up the individual. Uh, and building up the common good. And our Lord sees this and recognizes it in the man, uh, and so uh, points to him uh, so that we will see it. Obviously, there's reasons to be suspicious of authority when you see it uh, done poorly. But, I, you know, I also think that there, I don't know, is it, I don't know if this is an American thing or, or, or what, but it seems like there's this net, we have this knee-jerk reaction to authority. Is that because we don't, do we have a, a misguided sense of what, obedience actually is in the spiritual life? I mean, have we just sort of thrown that away in the West? Well, in the natural order, I think probably, uh, and of course the natural order is touched by concupiscence and, and personal sin. You know, th- there, the, the, the founding of this country and the, the, the kind of uh, first hundred years or so um, are, are built on, uh, on a kind of um, a strong sense of personal responsibility and a, uh, a confidence and even a courage to uh, establish a new way of life. And much of that is admirable or uh, it was admirable. But 
uh, one of the dangers to which we're prone is that our strengths can be turned against us. And so m- now the self-confidence and the courage and the determination to build something new and to step away from the established order can, can now be a, a, what, what you're indicating, a, a suspicion of, uh, of authority as authority, not authority poorly exercised but just authority in general. And uh, so maybe there's some uh, strains of this that are, are part of our kind of political fiber, or social fiber. But really, David, I mean, the, the enemy of authority is selfishness and sin. And that is what weakens uh, like poison, uh, like a cancer. It weakens my capacity to be self-forgetful. And to put aside my comfort and my preference and say yes. So John Paul, quoting Pius the Twelfth, said, "The sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin," and that that is startling and disturbing. Uh, it's one thing to be immoral; it's another thing to be amoral, and the, the latter is worse. So you know the, the sins that we commit, even if people don't think they're committing sins or don't believe in the category of sin, are eroding our sense of uh, of obedience and the, and the good that is authority. Hey, a quick interruption, folks, to say that Working Man is sponsored by Harmel Academy of the Trades. There are millions, that's right, I said millions of skilled trade jobs that are simply unfilled today. Manufacturers, electricians, contractors, builders, plumbers, employers of all stripes are desperate to find skilled men to fill these positions, but few men are showing up. Harmel Academy is a residential Catholic trade academy looking to help fill this gap, not only by providing training in the skilled trades, but by addressing the deeper problem, the lack of understanding about why and how work helps us to flourish and to live into our calling as collaborators with God in virtue and holiness. Our inaugural class starts in the fall of 2020 and we're taking applications now. So head over to harmelacademy.org to learn more about how you can join our unique brotherhood of Catholic tradesmen. Now, back to our chat with Father Chet. You and I have spoken many times in the past about uh, there being a crisis in the world and not just in the church, not just being, you know, people acting poorly, but this, but this real um, crisis in the sense of what manhood and what, what the masculine is, is, yeah. is, is the, um, the crisis of authority related in any way to this crisis of, 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 of the masculine genius? Yeah. Well, I think so because men are, um, uh, by their architecture, uh, built to be part of a hierarchical society. If, if women are parochial in the sense that they, their uh, first love is the home and the protection of the home and the providing what is necessary for the home to grow, then then men are, are ambassadorial, let's say. And that means there is this kind of stepping out of the home and representing the home to the world and the world to the home. And that's only going to be able to do- be done in, in a structure that is going to have authority. Uh, first in the home, even in the marriage, and then in, um, in the civil society, in the civil order. Uh, and then, of course, in the ecclesiastical order as well. So th- there's, th- there's something woven into the fiber of the man. And if, if, he's, if this is something that he's not living, then he's actually uh, frustrating himself because it's something that he he wants. I can recall sort of again sort of my Marine Corps days, but I've also seen it here in in formation. Men appreciate discipline when it has a purpose and when they can see the fruit of it. And, and, and discipline is another word, probably like authority, that leaves a bad taste in people's mouths because it sounds like something harsh and severe. But that, that's not really what it is. Discipline is restraining those tendencies within me that are self-destructive or maybe not as dramatic undermine the, the, the fulfillment of my heart and, and, and my capacity to flourish. Uh, while at the same time, in a positive sense, directing through virtue, the energy that is in me in a way. So that's, that's what the purpose of discipline is. And uh, when it, that's exercised well, men appreciate it. And, 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 and it makes them happier. Uh, they have better morale. They have better sense of themselves. And they can see the things that they've accomplished. 
um, and they're and they're grateful for it, and and that makes them want to persevere. Again, not necessarily in a selfish way. I'm not talking about somebody who's just sort of beating their breast and saying, "Look what I'm doing," but rather that 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 uh, uh, good stewardship in, in Christian idiom of uh, blessings and graces that have been been given to us by God. So what I mean when we lose a sense of these things, when we lose either an experiential sense of them in our lives, or even just a uh, an abstract sense of of the very notion of the thing, when those things are gone, what is the steps of revitalizing them? I mean, what are the practical steps for men to rediscover and reincorporate if they don't come from a place of uh, where that has been the norm, or maybe they're just only now discovering yeah. these these virtues? So years ago. Uh, Pope Benedict in a talk, or maybe it was a sermon, was suggesting that there are a couple of uh, healthy and and fruitful avenues by which the gospel can be preached and heard and made attractive to people. One is through beauty, by by which I mean, uh, I I think he meant um, a, a number of different things, whether it's art, architecture, music, the liturgy, and uh, uh, the, the sacred scripture, how Christ is presented to the world. But the second thing he said was the communion of saints. The communion of saints has credibility for us because uh, these men and women are witnesses. They have shown us the way through their lives. So I think that uh, personal witness to the truth, whether it's in the natural order or the sacred order, is a way to capture a man's imagination. So that can be done through literature and the humanities and books and stories, movies. And then in the, in the sacred order, it's done through the example of holy men and women, some of whom have gone to their eternal reward or saints, and some of them are still laboring in the vineyard and uh, are recognizable for their personal sanctity. So I, I think that the the enfleshed virtue and witness of someone who's living a, an integrated life is indispensable for recovering the lost ground that you're speaking of. So I, I want to get to the the question of the the moral content of of human work, but I, I want to go back to this this notion of 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 freedom being you know the ability to to act with excellence, to act with virtue. What is it that makes a man free? Mm. So we're at, we're at a point where, of course, it's necessary for us to define terms, because in, in Galatians, St. Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. And freedom could appear to be standing uh, sort of on the cusp of many different options, even many good options, as, as on a menu, for instance. Uh, or it could be understood to be, well, I'm, I'm free to be good or to be bad. But these are superficial or even incorrect definitions of freedom. Uh, in John 8, our Lord says, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Or in John Paul's idiom or language, uh, truth is the inner measure of freedom. In my moral theology class, I like to say to the students, um, if you ever go to a greeting card store, uh, and you see a card that says to err is human and to forgive is divine, leave it on the shelf because it may be very fine hallmark sentimentality, but it's uh, very poor anthropology and it's very poor Christianity. Yes, we know that it is uh, kind of constituent in the sense of our human nature because uh, of original sin and our own human weakness uh, and sinfulness to fall, to err. In, in the language of the card. I don't mean to make a mistake in my checkbook that's just an honest error, but I mean to do something selfish or sinful. And yes, it's certainly true that, that God in his goodness and his divine generosity uh, doesn't have to forgive us, of course, but wants to out of, out of love for his children. But the truth of the matter, David, is that we do not become more human by falling down to our humanity. We do not become more human by sinning. We actually degrade our dignity. We make it more difficult for us to find fulfillment by uh, virtue of sin. And therefore, the more that we sin, the less free we are, because we are acquiring uh, habits 
called vices that make it more difficult for us to exercise uh, a freedom that is the fruit of truth, both in terms of the intellectual understanding, the knowledge of it, but also the truth of the moral life and the way in which we uh, testify to uh, the goodness of, of, of man and, and, and to Christ, of course, by what we choose to do. If we don't have the right understanding of what freedom is, then, then we will uh, perhaps exercise it wrongly, or we will think something is free when, in fact, it's enslaving. Well, so I think the basic formula would be, in, in, in keeping with what Christ said, uh, and he's, he's bearing witness to a human truth, uh, even before it's a divine truth, that is to say, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. We, we are free to the degree or in the measure in which we act in a way consistent with our human nature in the natural order and uh, to the degree that we act in keeping with our discipleship, our Christianity. So, Let's think just of the human virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, the moral virtues, and then the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. To the degree that we act in a way consistent with those things, we're building up our freedom and we're acting freely. To the degree that we don't, then we are in, we're, we're impeding our freedom. Father, as you know, I could... Uh listen to you for hours, but I, but I won't. Um, <laughs> thank you for, again, everything. I hope we can do it again. Well, let me uh, finish with a quote from a man who is uh, substantially informed, shaped, refined, and directed my thinking, and that's my patron, St. Saint Saint Paul. And in the letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, he says, God works for the good in all things for those who love him. So in all things. Uh, uh, Paul does not exclude the difficult things, the hard things, the disappointing things, the painful things, uh, uh, the things that, that we don't like or that we didn't ask for. He doesn't exclude those. And then the test is for those who love God. God works for the good in all things for those who love him, who trust him. So, of course, the highest example of this is the cross. We see something that is uh, awful. Uh, the worst thing that could have happened did happen. The Savior was uh, was nailed to the cross, but out of that comes our salvation. So I think that's the era also uh, uh, that we are living in, in the sense of the invitation uh, to allow God's uh, uh, grace to uh, powerfully draw uh, the good uh, from the bad. Well, great. Father, again, thank you very much. God bless you, and I hope hope you guys stay safe out there. I hope this is of some service to, to those who will hear it. I have no doubt of that. Thank you, Father. Right, peace to you. Hey, thanks, folks, for listening. If you like this show, I hope you'll consider helping us out, and there are three ways you can do it. First, if you know someone you think would enjoy this podcast, send it their way, maybe with a kind note and a six-pack. Second, you can leave a review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And third, if you know someone who would be interested in Harmel Academy, please send them our way via harmelacademy.org or on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. It's only by building a network of folks who believe in what we're doing that we can hope to be successful in doing it. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time.